Hi, I'm Stephanie Hubbard. This is my book, Bluff Island Rescue Service. It's a memoir. Um, I'm going to read from you a chapter that starts about page, it starts on page 68. Um, and what's happening, basically what's happened on pages 1 through 68 is um, when I was a kid, I lived on an island called Bluff Island with my dad, whose name is Jake, and, um, and my mom. And uh, so we lived on this island. And then um, on page 68, my father's kind of can be challenging sometimes, and this is probably one of the more fun chapters. Um, by page 68, he says, uh, we're going to go here. And he points to a map, and there's like a tiny blob in the middle of Lake Ontario. And so one of my favorite lines is that we're, we're going to, um, let me see if I can find it here. Apparently, even people on remote islands have to get away from it all by going to even more remote islands. So this is the story of us going to a place called Duck Island. And um, while we're on the, uh, the, the route, my father is testing us all the time, um, trying to prepare us to be um, wonderful sea, I guess, seamen, because that's what it's called, uh, to, to be uh, sailors. So Jake quizzes me on seamanship. You're, you've anchored on a north shore. The wind is coming from the south. During the night, the wind moves into the north and blows you toward the shore. Your anchor is dragging and your engine is out. What do you do? Sail off, I guess. No, your boat is being smashed on the rocks. Think fast. Jake is laughing and teasing me, but I can't think of anything else. Just tell me, please. Put your backup anchor in your dinghy and row offshore. Then drop the backup anchor. Row back to the boat and start winching in the new anchor line to pull yourself off the lee shore. I do a mental checklist. We have two anchors on board and the blow up dinghy is scudding along behind us. We are prepared. I like how Jake is preparing me for self-sufficiency. It takes three days of sailing all day, then anchoring at night, sleeping and cooking on our tiny boat with no galley or toilet or sink. But finally, we get to Duck Island. Rounded gray stones about four yards deep line the beaches. The stones make musical sounds as we walk over them. Here in the middle of an inland ocean, my weight makes the rocks settle and clink against each other. No human being has heard that sound in a thousand years, pronounces Jake. I look down at my feet and the little broken songs of the stones ring out special just for us. We walk from the one harbor with a lighthouse through open fields of hay and pasture land. I like this place. There are rutted roads where every hour or so another person walks by. Because we are visiting their island, they are friendly to us and we are friendly to them. We walk all over Duck Island. I fall in love with its bluntness. We are on an island with other people and we don't have to hate them. I want to stay on Duck Island forever. There are only two bunks below in Dulcibella, that's the name of our boat. So my mom has one and my brother has the other. I sleep on the floor in between them. Daddy sleeps outside on the floor of the cockpit with a sail over him against the dew. This trip, Daddy has been rereading Kidnapped to us. When he finishes the chapter, he takes a picture of his family ready for bed. I am in a pink flowery nightgown with princess puff sleeves. I take my glasses off so I'll look cute for the picture. I am in my spot on the floor flanked by Rufus and Mommy. We are all smiling, brown as berries, on our family island trip away from the island. In the night, a squall blows up from the west. It is like a sailing training question. A storm comes up from the west. Do you ride it or wait it out? Jake decides it is just what he needs to get some training for the Atlantic. Once we leave the safety of Duck Island Harbor and the westward waves start hitting us, and the wind is blowing us faster and faster away from Duck Island, it's clear we cannot go back, no matter what ancient mariner's trick we employ. Each wave feels like it will blow Dulcibella apart. I sit up with Jake in my usual spot in the cockpit until I'm slapped with a gigantic wave from behind. Steffi, time to go below, he says. I want to argue to stay, but I know better. Aye, aye, sir, I say and wait for the waves to time my crossing to the hatch. What had been a cozy place to sleep has become chaos. Towels and clothes have been tossed everywhere. Mommy and Rufus are throwing up again and again into a bucket. 
They have wedged themselves into a corner of the bunk. Whatever this is, it is serious. Whatever this is, I would rather be in the wind-scoured cockpit than down here. I stagger to the steps, up to the hatch, hold on and poke my head out into the screaming wind. I'm ready to argue for my ascent, but when I see the waves towering 20 feet above my father's head, I am speechless. I didn't even know waves could be larger than a boat. Next we are on top of the wave and it's only sky around us and that is when I notice that Jake has a line tied around his body to hold him into his seat. He yells at me, what is it? Mommy and Rufus is throwing up. I tell him, they're just seasick. He roars back, what's that? I yell, pointing at the rope across his waist outside of one of the cheap green rubber raincoats. He's not tied in exactly. He's just leaning against the line, which is helping him to stay in his seat high up in the cockpit as Dulcie Bella is blown up onto her side by the storm. It's a lifeline, he yells back. A lifeline for what? In case the water tries to sweep me over. Another wave towers up again, first 20, then 30 feet above him. I look back at my mother. She is so sick right now, and even if she weren't, she doesn't know how to handle a boat. I cannot even allow the possibility that he might be swept overboard, allow for what could possibly happen if first one big wave filled the cockpit, then another filled the cabin. All I know is that I must be up and out of the cabin, up in the cockpit with my dad. He might need help. I need to be riding through the storm with him. I'm coming up to help. No, stay below, he calls out of his square mouth. Determined not to be lumped with the sick ones, determined to have crucial information to save whoever of us might be left if the storm becomes more aggressive, I brace myself into the hatch and stay there. I stand by and watch the rollers rise up behind his head again and again. But more striking than the waves is my father's huge smile. I have never seen him happier, strapped to a boat, inadequate to the task, his family captive passengers below.